right? We're gonna jump into the message. Before we do that, we also know that on the other side of that camera is our church family. They're at River Bend Maximum Security Institute and at DeBerry Church Family. Come on, welcome them. Love you guys. Awesome to be along for the ride. We are in week one of a brand new series. It's an annual series that we do here at Connect called You Asked For It. It is the result of a survey that we take at Easter, and we basically ask you, what would you like to hear a sermon on or learn more about? You say, why do you do that, Devin? Well, Jesus did it a lot in his ministry. A lot of Jesus' teachings were in result or in response to questions that were asked of him. His message on prayer was in response to the disciples saying, hey, could you teach us how to pray like that? How do we pray like that? His message in Matthew 15 on worship was in response to the Pharisees questioning him. How do I worship? His, his response in Mark chapter 10 to the rich young ruler on what it meant to live a disciplined life and what it meant to follow Christ was in response to questions. Jesus did it over and over all throughout scripture. So that's the reason We've done it and you've asked for it. And so we're gonna try to give you some biblically sound answers for the questions that you've been asking over the next five weeks. We will be addressing the top five answers that you gave us. Those top five answers are this. You came back to us with these topics, hearing the voice of God, growing as a leader, prayer and spiritual warfare, healthy relationships, and dealing with unanswered prayer. I've been studying for this one a few months. I'm excited about this message here. But today we're gonna be starting with healthy relationships, healthy relationships. And just the fact that you've asked about it means that you want better, stronger relationships, whether that's with your kids or in your marriage or at school or in your workplace, you're looking for better, stronger, healthier relationships. Let's start in Matthew 22. We soaked through it earlier this week. Here's what it says. This is Jesus responding to the Pharisees. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law, they ask him. And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then it goes on to say in verse 38, this is, he, he reiterates, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law, the, the entire scripture and all of the prophets' teachings could be summarized in those two commandments, what are they talking about? They're talking about relationships, our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Your relationship decisions are the most important decisions you will make in this life. All of heaven and all of earth are determined by your relationships. Your eternity is determined by your relationship with God. Your experience here on earth is determined by the relationships that you have with others. The old adage is actually true. It's not what you know, it's who you know. It's actually true. Relationships is what life is all about. It's going to determine where you spend eternity and it's gonna determine your experience here on earth. It's the one thing that has the most influence on where you've been it's the one thing that has the most influence on where you are right now. And it's the one thing that will have the most influence on where you are going from here. Your relationships, your past, your present, and your future are all connected and contingent upon the people that you are connected with. But here's the problem. Most of us are missing the right relationships. And you'll never do all that God wants you to do. You will never accomplish all that God wants you to accomplish without the right people in your life. So today, I, I hope that a couple things happen. I hope that you are encouraged to pursue relationship, but I'm also hoping that you go encouraged to pursue healthy ones. And in several instances, the Bible tells us that relationships are important. Ecclesiastes chapter four, look what it says. Two people are, what's the word? Are better. Two people are better, and you're going, well, it depends on who the other person is <laughs> that makes us two. Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. And the challenge is we've been trying to succeed by ourselves. Two people are better. Jesus said it this way, for where two or three gather in my name as my followers, I am there among them. So there's something powerful that happens when Christians come together. The power and the presence of God is with us when we commune together. But here's the deal. I hear lots of reasons why people don't pursue relationship. 
Why, why don't you have healthy relationships in your life? So I would just like to very briefly address the reasons that I hear most often on why people don't pursue relationship before we look at what healthy ones actually look like. Here's, here's one of the reasons, just simply naivety. Some of you genuinely don't know how badly you need relationship in your life. Like you, you simply have convinced yourself somewhere along the way that you can actually handle this thing called life on your own. That's why Solomon in the same chapter, just one verse earlier than the one we read earlier, look what he says in verse eight of that same chapter, chapter four. There was a man all alone, going Lone Ranger. He had neither son nor brother. Now that's talking even more broadly than just biological connection. He has literally no one in his life. And that may be the way you're perceiving your life. You're convinced you have no one in your life. And now you've convinced yourself you don't need anyone in your life. But look, look at the result. Because he had no relationships in his life, there was no end to his toil. And his eyes were not content with his wealth. So he tried to do what only relationships can provide. This guy thinks, well, if I work harder and if I find a hobby that I like by myself and if I spend more hours at the office and if I make more money, I'll, I'll, I'll be content. And he finds himself all alone and discontent because your life change is directly connected to who is in your life. Reminds me of the story of Muhammad Ali, the boxing champion. He was on a plane headed to one of his fights, the flight attendant attendant was telling everyone they need to put their seatbelts on and Muhammad Ali said Superman don't need no seatbelt to which the flight attendant responded Superman didn't need no plane either buckle up <laughs> right <laughs> and some of us are kind of like that we think I can do this on my own and you can't here's the second reason that I hear this is why I don't pursue relationships it's just my temperament Devin it's just the way God made me and I'm just kind of shy and introverted and I just don't feel comfortable getting together with people. And for those that have used that reason, can I just tell you respectfully, that's not good enough. You need relationships in your life. Here's the third reason that I, that I hear why people don't pursue relationships. Simply, it's fear. Fear, and let me give you the two fears that I hear most often. It's the fear of dealing with conflict. I, well, I don't want to have to deal with that because here's what we know. If we pursue relationships, that's going to involve people. And if any time people are involved, it's going to include conflict. Any, anyone here just love conflict? Just love it. I mean, just wake up hoping I have conflict today. Any, anybody love? Nobody loves it. I mean, some people seems like they love it. How many of you just get anxious thinking of a disagreement? I mean, you're like, oh, I can't even raise my hand because someone might disagree with me right now. I mean, I just can't, I can't even, I just get, I get anxious thinking of it. Proverbs actually has a lot to say about conflict and the characteristics that are revealed in people's lives that love conflict. Because the reality is all of us know somebody that just loves it. I mean, they would say they don't, but for some reason there's always conflict when they're around. Anybody, does anyone know? Don't look at them. Don't look at them. Just, we know somebody like that. Proverbs 29. Look at, look at Proverbs 29. Says, it says, an angry person stirs up some stuff. And a hot-tempered person commits many sins. Proverbs 16. Look what it says. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. you have anybody like that? It's like they're just like cast, all the time just casting seed and strife over here and gossip separates the best of friends. Just da, 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 da. Conflict thrives in and through anger, negativity, division. So, so if you're an angry person, a negative person, a gossipy person, is that the end of word? Conflict, I promise you, is gonna be nearby. Let me give you another uh, trait that, that births conflict. It's jealousy. Look what James says in chapter four. We read it earlier this week. I think we read this yesterday in our soap. What, here's the question that we often have. What's causing all the conflict? Don't, look, James answers it. Don't they come, the conflicts, the quarrels, the arguments, don't they come from something in you? Here, and here's the answer. Here's where conflict starts. You want what you don't have. I see something I want that you have and I'm gonna do whatever I, I can to get it. You scheme 
and you, oh, I would never kill it. Not, not physically, but you would with your words. You'd call someone up and tell someone what you think about them because they have something you don't want. Then it goes on to say, that's the last, there okay. And you are, here's the word, here's the word. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them, yet you don't have what you want because you're looking for the wrong, to the wrong person to provide it to you. You need to be looking to God to be providing the things that will only bring you contentment in your life. If conflict just seems to be following you around, it would be good for you to just check your own heart. Like if, if you just always have conflict around, if the common denominator, you know what I've found about every fight I've ever been in, every conflict I've ever been in, I was there, I, I was present. And if you just can't seem to get away from it, you might just want to check your own, is there any bitterness? Is there any anger, any jealousy, any gossip, any divisive spirit at all in you? Because we always get frustrated by the external behavior of conflict, but James tells us that it's actually first an internal issue. So that person that's attacking you, criticizing you, stirring things up, constantly talking about other people, causing division, you need to pray for them because it's actually something inside of them. They're having an internal conflict and now externalizing that conflict on everyone else around you. And yet as much as we don't like it, we understand we're going to have to deal with it. So you can't eliminate conflict, but you can manage it. And healthy relationships People that have those healthy relationships, they have learned how to deal with conflict in a healthy way, which means they don't ignore it, they deal with it. How do I deal with it? James tells us this in chapter one, verse 19. Look what he says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. If you wanna learn how to manage some conflict in your life, everyone, that's all of us, everyone should be, just make this one of your life verses, everybody. I'm just telling you, quick to listen and slow to speak. And if you get that in the right order, please go back for me. If you get that in the right order, back to verse 19, thank you. If you get this in the right order, you will be slow to become angry. And we just learned that anger is where conflict comes out of. So if you, but listen, if you get this in the wrong order, if you are slow to listen and quick to speak, you will be quick to become angry and you will be quick to find yourself in conflict. Now go to verse 20 and it says, because human anger does not produce the right living, that's what righteousness means, that God desires, not just with him, but with, man, with, with our friends, with the people around us. It doesn't produce healthy relationships. We have to give and live with grace. What is grace in terms of how you relate to others? Grace is very simply this. It's giving others what they need, not what you think they deserve. What, what do you need? How many need some, I need some grace up in, in this right here. Well, you, you should now be an extension of God's grace. Rather than giving them what you think they deserve, give them what they need. They need some grace. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious. They're filled with grace. But fools are consumed by their own lips because they're quick to speak and slow to listen. We should be an extension of God's grace. Our word should be an extension of God's grace. We have to learn to resolve conflict, not create it. All right, here's, here's the other fear that I hear. Why I don't pursue relationships, fear is a reason, but here's the other fear that I hear. It's exposing the real you. I don't want people to know who I really am. Well, what will they think of me if they really start to know what I'm really dealing with? And I understand that could be kind of scary. The thought of inviting people into the real places of your life and bringing people into the sacred spaces of your heart, letting people know, hey, here's where I'm struggling. Here's what I'm doing. Letting, letting your guard down, the pressure of having it all together can be daunting. The, having the ability to trust. Because he, here's what the enemy convinces us of. You're the only one. Well, you're the only one dealing with that. I mean, if you say that out loud, people aren't going to know what to do with that because you're the only one in the history of humanity that's ever dealt with that. No one is struggling in that area. No one. I mean, you're dealing with, oh my goodness, I've never even heard of that. 
He convinces us we're the only one dealing with a specific issue. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. Here's what he says. Relationship is born when one person says to another, you too? (laughs) I thought I was the only one. And you keep resisting relationship and that's actually where relationship begins. Your willingness to share in, to, to have empathy and sympathy towards what you're dealing with. The reality is, listen to me, people connect with your struggle long before they connect with your success. I promise you. You know who I've learned the most from? The people that were willing to share their weaknesses, their shortcomings, their, their mistakes, their missteps. I just turn my, I just listen really quickly and they go, man, you know where I missed it? Woo, I'm listening. And I'm learning now. And people, I promise you, they connect more quickly with your struggle than when you start rattling off all your successes. I've just learned, I've learned that my impact on other people's lives is gonna be dependent upon my willingness to to share where I missed it. And you gotta learn that too. All right, here's here's another reason I hear why, why people don't engage in relationship. It's their past experiences. Their past experiences. There's some of us that have been burned relationally. In fact, some of you are here today and you're walking into this place relationally wounded. And your response to the wound wasn't to get healed, but instead your response to the wound was, I'm never gonna let that happen to me ever again. And although, and I understand that response, but I also know it's not the right response. I'm never gonna let someone hurt me again. I'm never gonna trust again. I'm never gonna open up. I'm never gonna be transparent. Again, Micah the prophet found himself in a, in a state of mind where he was in that kind of thinking. Look what he says in Micah chapter seven. He says this, don't trust anyone. Don't do it. This is the Bible, everybody. Don't like no one, not even your wife. Well, trust her, my best friend. You can't trust anyone. Does anyone ever just... Maybe you're like Pastor Todd a little bit and you've just gone to the nth degree on something and then you're like, oh my goodness, I can't, I can't trust anyone. Micah allows a broken trust to result in him not trusting anyone. You see, lack of trust is often a result of a past unresolved relational conflict. You didn't learn how to deal with the conflict and so rather than dealing with it, you just assume I won't have a relationship altogether for the rest of my life. You will always have an opportunity to use past relational conflict as an excuse not to trust. Well, Devin, you don't understand. People have hurt me. People have stabbed me in the back. People have abandoned me and lied to me. And people have let me down and manipulated me and deceived me. Welcome to the world. Welcome to being a human, everybody. Welcome to being a part of the human race. Isn't everyone encouraged today to know that you're not the exception? Just please, please hear this. Please hear this. Just because someone breaks your trust doesn't mean that everyone's going to break your trust. You've got to take a step. Why is it so painful when trust is broken? Well, because trust is a matter of the heart. Proverbs 3 tells us this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust is a matter of the heart. So when trust is broken, your heart is broken. Trust, it takes time to develop it again, to take the step of faith and courage. And some of us need to deal with some unresolved past conflict so that our heart can trust. Okay, let me just give you one more reason why. I'm just giving you the reasons why people don't pursue relationship. And you you, you know which one's coming. It's this one. Well, I just don't have time. I'm just too busy. I know, but you called me to tell me that you don't have any friends. I mean that, well, I'm just, I'm already out eight nights a week. I mean, I just, I just don't have time. I don't, I don't have time, Devin. I mean, it's just all, it's all spoken for. You know what I, you know what I found? I found that it's less about time and it's more about priority. And, and let me just give you an easy way to find out what you value. When you look at your calendar, you will quickly find out what you value. Just look at your calendar and you'll find out what you value. You can look at your calendar yesterday and you can find out what you value. What do you value? It might not be worth what you're putting all the value in. Then the hours that you spent painstakingly thinking they were coming back, they were never in the game. You just, you took all this time, right? Look at your calendar 
You know what you value. If this is the only time you set aside to have a convo with God, you're telling me how much you value your relationship with God. I mean, if you're just depending on Devin to bring something to get me through the next six days. I mean, if, if Ashley didn't get any undivided time from me, what would that say about how much I value her and value our relationship? I have to create and protect time. I need to make it a priority. Because here's the deal. Relationships of any value take time. We have to invest time. And I use that word intentionally. We have to invest time because the return doesn't come immediately. It's an investment. You make investments in relationship. Relationships grow best with time over time. You got to make time over time. You can't just do it one time. You got to make time over time. Time is the incubator for stronger, healthier relationships. And how many want healthier relationships? We all want healthier relationships. Okay, so let me just look at all five of the reasons that I, that I hear the most. Give me all five of them if you can, please. Next slide. I'll give them to you. It's naivety, it's temperament, fear, past experiences, and busyness. All five of them I hear all of the time. You know what I think? I think deep down inside... We know we need it. We, we know that it's what's right for us. And I truly believe to my core that every person actually wants it. Genuine, authentic, deep, meaningful relationship. How can you say that, Devin? Because that's the way that God wired us. He wired us that way. Romans chapter 12, look what it says in verse five. We are all parts of the body of Christ and it takes every one of us to make it complete, for we each have a different work to do. Look what it says now. We belong to each other and each needs all the same. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need me. You need me. You need me. You, you need me. Yeah, you need, turn to, the, turn to your second choice and tell them we belong. We belong together. We belong. Yeah, your second choice. We need each other. We belong to each other. Pastor Rick Warren contends that there are stages that people move through, that they intentionally have to move through in how they engage in the world of church. Uh, just, just as a little bit of a framework, I'm going to use it as a springboard for what I want to teach us on the back half of this message. But, but I want to use this as a template, this as a framework, what he originally presented in the purpose driven life, he, he contends that there are specific stages as we engage in this kind of community. The first one is the crowd. The crowd, we, we engage in the crowd. The crowd consists of the people who attend church sporadically. Could you please give me that graphic on the crowd, please? Thank you. The crowd consists of the people who attend church sporadically. They disappear and reappear. It's like magic. They leave with no notice and they show back up with no notice. They may even attend a few different churches. Uh, they kind of just float in and float out. By the way, we didn't plant this church just to gather a crowd. Okay, I, did, I actually didn't get in this to get a crowd to listen to me run my mouth every week. That's not why I got into this. Because the goal isn't just church growth. It's a healthy church. Now, I believe in church growth because people matter and heaven and hell are real and eternity is at stake. So we should be growing, but, but it's not just the growth, it's healthy growth and a healthy church finds ways to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be in their spiritual journey. Okay, here's the second stage, it's the congregation. Now, this includes people who attend regularly. Now, I put that in quotes because Today's version of the regular attender is very different than what it was when I was a regular attender of church. Because I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Friday night. Awesome. Can we do something else too? Oh, let's do a potluck on Saturday. Great. I'm there. Awesome. It's great. And today, if we attend every four to six weeks, we are a regular attender. Um, and we consider ourselves to be a member 
of the church. If someone asks if you have a home church, oh yeah, I go to that, uh, what's it? it's that, uh, that connect church thing. Yeah, I go there. Who's the pastor? I don't know. Scrawny guy, I don't, what's his? <laughs> Can't remember his name. Hey, if you, ever wanna, if you ever wanna test someone on how committed they are to their church, ask them who their pastor is. Yeah. Oh yeah, I go to that church. Who's the pastor? Oh man, oh, it's, uh, whew. you know, it's been a while since I've been there. Okay, I thought so. Just, uh, just, it's, I'm just telling you, it's a test. Uh, the congregation, and now you move now to the committed. Now, these believers are not only members who attend regularly, but they are growing in their relationship with Jesus, establishing habits and disciplines of a disciple. So now they're taking real steps, real movement, which then hopefully gets them to the core. Now, so amongst the committed is another segment of people who, who get involved and serve others through the ministries of the church. So they not only attend regularly and tithe regularly and are growing in their relationship with Jesus and are in a connect group, and, but they're giving now of their time. Even though they don't have any time to give, they're giving of it. They, they've gone through next steps. By the way, today, today is the first weekend of the month. And if there's anyone here that's saying, I, would, I wanna figure out how do I get involved how do, I take, how do I take the next? Today is step one of our next steps process. We call it connect very simply. And you'll learn how we started the church and you'll learn all about our governance and our infrastructure. It's the first step. Well, if you wanna go on the journey of eventually coming to the core, it's a step you have to take. You're in a group and, and you're giving of your time and you're serving on a regular basis using your gifts and abilities. Okay, so that's the movement. Can you give me the slide on the full movement from... The crowd to the core, please. This is the movement that we're looking to see happening in your life. Now, this movement, and this is where I'm going to springboard from Pastor Warren's idea. This movement simply doesn't happen without your relationships being intact. You can't do this movement in isolation. You can't do this movement with, with, with bad association. You're gonna make this movement with the right relationships in your life. And you may be thinking, what does that have to do? It has everything to do with your relationships. Because the process and progression of moving from the crowd to the core is directly impacted by your relationships. So healthy movement in your life is contingent upon the who and how you relate to God and others. So I'm gonna prove it to you because all of us have five aspects of our lives that lead to five needs in our lives. And unless we're intentionally pursuing community, these aspects of our lives will go untouched. Okay, so here's, here's the first aspect of your life and it actually aligns with the movement that we've just walked through. And this is, first of all, the public you. The public version of you. Now, there are some things that I know about you just by being here today. You like coffee. You like to spill coffee. I know that about you. I know that about you. Uh, I mean, you, you, you must like it. You do it a lot. So you, you, I mean, you must like to do that. Uh, you don't like the front. I know this about you. you, you how, how can I get away from him? How do I get as far away from him as possible and still actually maybe even see a glimpse of him? Uh, just by being here, you know some things about me. You know that I'm not a UT fan. You know that about me now. You, you, you know that I like hairspray. I mean, you know, that I, you know things about me. <laughs> You've heard me speak for 20 minutes. You know I'm probably not from the South. And we know things about each other just by being in public together. And you can pop in and pop out and not really commit and just be a part of the crowd and where do you go to church? Oh man, I, I, I go a couple places. I kind of slide in and slide out. I go to this one place. I really like the worship there. So I go there for a little bit and I come over here and do that one. It's the public aspect of our lives, but it's just the public side of us. It's not the real side of us, which is what leads us to the first need. And that is this, I need people who really know me. And you need people that really know you. I need people in my life that really know me. Why? Because there's another side of me beyond my public person. 
I need people that love me but aren't impressed by me. First Corinthians chapter two says this, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. In other words, all of us have this public side, but we also have this inside part of us. It's the other, it's the real side of you. You say, well, Devin, why do I need somebody that really knows me? Hear me, because all of us at some point are gonna have that day. Yep. <laughs> that day when we're fed up. That day we're like, I'm done. All done. Someone take the kids. I'm done. That, that day when you get the phone call, that day when you get the diagnosis, that day when your child gets rushed to the ER, that we're all going to have that day. And if you don't have people in your life that know you, it's going to be difficult to make it through those days. I mean, not a lot of people, just a few. So that when you're going through it, we're going through it. Something all of us needs because we're going to all have that day. Okay, here's the second aspect of our lives. We move from the public you to now the perceived you. The perceived you. And this is where most people stop when it comes to church. In a southern Bible Belt context, we do what we're supposed to do on Sunday. I, I attend, I check it off. I have some familiarity with some faces. I wave at the same people. They know that I was there. I'm good with them. I'm good with God. It's a religious transaction. <laughs> I feel better about my life. So we present something externally with the hope that we never have to deal with what's really internally going on. Which basically means I know some things about myself that you don't know and I don't want you to know. So there's a perceived version of me. It's called the mask. And let me just say to you, sir, ma'am, young person, if there's something that only you know about, you are not safe. You are in a bad spot. You're not in a good place. Somebody needs to know where you're being tempted. Somebody needs to know where your weakness is. Somebody needs to know you. Which leads us to the second need. It's the need for people to protect me. I need people to protect me. You need people to protect you. Protect me from what? Myself. And they cannot protect you if they don't know what's going on inside of you. So here's the third aspect of a person's life. Are you, listen, are you with me so far? I'm, I'm, you're talking about healthy relationships and you're wanting to move through this process, but you're gonna have to engage relationally with other people to move through the process. So you have the public you, the perceived you, and now you have the private you. The private you. And this is where you start to commit to the idea that you can't be the only one that knows. This is where you begin to pursue authentic, transparent relationship and you realize that it's crucial to your development and maturity as a believer. It's, it's here now in this process that you actually decide to take off the mask with a few people. Because, listen to me, you will never change what you are unwilling to confront. You will never change what you are unwilling to confront. It's an intentional decision. You actually start to look for people and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to people that God might be bringing into your life that you can take the mask off with. So that like Paul, you can say in 2 Corinthians chapter four, I refuse to wear masks and play the game. This is where we're trying to move all of us because we need this. Rather, we will keep everything we do and say out in open, the whole truth is on display so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. Now, some of you would do well to start doing that in your marriage. To stop playing the game and to take off the mask and have a real conversation. I mean, if you're gonna start anywhere, it seems to me that after your relationship with God, you would have that kind of relationship with the supposedly the most important person on this planet other than Jesus. Take off the mask, stop playing the game. It's really the only way that you're going to get over habitual sin in your life. 
Because listen, God will forgive you. But James 5 tells us that if we confess our faults and pray for one another, that's actually where healing happens. So God can forgive you, but you experience healing when you confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. And some of us have been forgiven, but we know we're not healed. Because you've been, you've been okay with the perceived you. You're okay staying with everyone not knowing anything about you. God will forgive you, but you need a person in your life if you want to experience healing. In fact, if you move to this place, this is the place where you actually start to allow people to address the blind spots in your life. Oh, I, oh my goodness. Well, no, no, listen. You said you wanted healthy relationships. That's what you asked about. How do I get healthy relationships? And we all want healthy relationships, but we don't want to move to this place. But we're mad that we don't have them. And, and when someone tries to address the blind spot, we get offended and we take our ball and we go home. And then we disappear for a while and then we show back up a little bit and we go back to the crowd. Have, have you ever noticed that people have these areas in their lives so obvious? I mean, obvious. You're looking at them and you're going, how in the world? I mean, am I the only one that thinks this way? How in the world do they not see that about themselves? Okay, guess what, guess what, guess what? We all have those. And unless you have a person in your life that you are inviting to help you with them, you will never address the things that the whole world already sees. I mean, we need that person in our lives. It's like, dude, you got spinach in your teeth. Like, get it out. Like, that's what a friend does. You don't let them walk around like, hey, how you doing? I mean, it's like, you don't let them do that. You just don't. How about this guy's, how about when, the moment when you realize your fly is down? Okay, it's this panic, panic thought. How long has it been down? Who have I seen since it's been down? Who have I talked to? For me, who have I prayed with with my fly down? And I had nobody, who saw me and didn't tell me I have no friends? Good night. That's what friends do. <laughs> Here's the point. We all have blind spots. And a lot of you are walking around with your fly down and you don't know it. And if you did, you'd be embarrassed. And not, not everyone needs to know, but a few people do. And can I just say this? Some of us need to stop taking ourselves so seriously. I mean, just like, I mean, just loosen up. You know what I found? I need people in my life that laugh with me, at me, and for me. With me, at me, and because if you can't laugh at yourself, you need some, you got the wrong people in your life. And there are times, listen, when you're going to need them to laugh for you because you just can't pull your, you just can't, they need to laugh for you and with you. Look at Proverbs 17. What does it say? A cheerful heart. It's like a medicine. But you hang out with these folks all the time. How you doing? Oh, I'm just trying to, you know, get through. Can I, can I, transparent moment? I do not do well with negative people. And listen, I'm not talking about just having a bad day. I'm talking about every encounter I have with you is like, how you doing? Well, okay, I'm out. Bye. I mean, you just start. And I'm like, I got to go. That's going to jump on me. Bye. Is that it? I mean, I, according to Strength Finders, positivity is in my top five. So it's like the, the glass is not only half empty, it's overflowing, everybody. So if you come to me trying to take some of the water that's overflowing, get away. Bye. You know what I mean, it's like, you know, it's, people are like elevators. They say, right, they're either taking you up or bringing you down. I want to make sure the arrow is going up before I step on that thing. And I just sense that when I'm getting close to someone, I can sense whether the arrow is facing up or down. I just feel it. And I go, Ooh, down. Nope. Uh, you going up? Yes. Okay. Let's go up. What's it based on? The people. The people that you know, Nehemiah said, don't be dejected and sad. The joy of the Lord is your strength, everybody. You're stronger than you're giving yourself credit for. Why? Because the joy of the overcoming reigning king of all time is living inside of you. It's your strength, everybody. Well, I, gotta, I guess four of us are like, yeah, I'm strong. 
Everything's just like down, which leads me to the third need. I need people who will be honest with me. And you need people that will be honest with you without you getting offended. I, I need someone that goes, Devin, your attitude stinks. You are a class A jerk. What's your deal today? I, listen, I hope for your sake you have someone like that in your life. Proverbs 27, look. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. So the Bible says that the good guy, the one you can trust is the one that's like, hey dude, it's like right here. Yeah, you gotta get that. The, the good guy is actually like, Who? It's the enemy that's like, boy, there's nothing in your life at all. You're awesome. You're perfect. Oh, you're an angel. The Bible says that's an enemy. If there's nothing ever wrong or needs to be corrected or addressed in your life from that person, they might not be as good of a friend as you thought they were. So here's the next, the public side of you, the perceived side of you, the private side of you, because you need to be known, you need to be protected, you need to have some honest people in your life. Here it is, it's the next aspect, it is the potential you. The potential you. Because now it's as you allow people into your life to see the real you, that they, they now have the ability to see some things in your life. And so they're not just addressing some areas where you need to grow, but they're seeing some areas where you could be an incredible blessing to the world and they start speaking to that in your life. So look, this is the movement that all of us want. I, I want to be living out the potential that's in me. This is what we all want. The problem is we're not willing to make the relational decisions to move through this place. We'd, we'd rather stay comfortable here and get mad that our potential isn't being spoken to. We'd rather kind of float around and not really commit and just say, well, that church doesn't, they're not really about people. No, you've got to make movement. So you no longer keep people at a distance. You're no longer okay with just the perceived you and the public you, but you're now moving to being okay with the private you, with a few people in your life being honest with you so that you can realize your potential. This is so important for you to understand because heart change happens in a moment, but life change is a process. Life change happens in a system. And God's system, listen to me closely, God's system is pulling out your best by connecting you to another member of the body of Christ. That's his system. That's why he calls us the body of Christ. We're not supposed to be an isolated body. That's, that's why my hand needs to be connected to my wrist and the wrist needs to be connected to my forearm. The forearm needs to be connected to this ma massive bicep and to the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ephesians chapter four, let's go there. He makes who? God makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As, how, how does he make it work perfectly? As all of us decide to go on the journey together, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other ones grow. Isn't this what we all want? We want to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Well, you can't complain about that not being your experience if you just wanna hang out in the crowd which is why the next need is I need people that cause me to grow. <laughs> this, this happens when we truly connect to the body of Christ. So, and if you're depending on Sunday to be the only place where you connect with people, get ready to be greatly disappointed because we need the larger gathering to get small. We need, we need something more than this. We need a place where I'm known, a place where they protect me, a place where they're honest with me, and a place where I'm spurred to growth. Proverbs 18, look, a man of many companions may come to ruin. So we come in the crowd and we know some people and oh yeah, I know you, sitting in the same sex this week, awesome, stay away, I don't wanna talk to you. But there is a friend who sticks closer. So we don't, we don't like closer. We're kind of like, I like the perceived me. It's kind of neat. 
I like the way they perceive me when I don't have to share them what I'm really dealing with. And I got lots of friends. The, the Bible says it's not enough to have a lot of companions, a lot of acquaintances. You need a few intimate friends, which is why I'm challenging you. Because a lot of you give me the excuses, and a lot of you are complaining that you're not experience your potential becoming real, but you're refusing to move through the process. It's why I'm challenging with everything in me. I'm challenging you to get in a group. I'm challenging you because you want the movement without doing the moving. How do I get there by staying here? You don't. And, and I'll be sitting across from you at Starbucks and you'll be saying the same thing to me. Because the healthier your relationships become, the healthier you become. So let me, I want you to grasp this thought. Your circle determines your cycle. Okay, now listen, I'm going to say it again. Your circle determines your cycle. We want our life to change but we don't want to change the circle. Like, if you want to change the cycle, what you've been dealing with for years, if you want to change the cycle, you have to change the circle. You, you'll never change the cycle if you don't change the circle. If you're not willing to change the circle, here's what you're really saying, I'm not interested in reaching my potential. You've got to change the circle in order to change the cycle. 1 Corinthians 15, look what it says. Don't fool yourself. You keep fooling yourself by surrounding yourself with the wrong circle and the wrong circle keeps you in the same cycle because bad friends will destroy you. But here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's not just the presence of the wrong voices in our lives that destroy us. It's the lack of the right voices. Because you could say, well, I don't really, I don't, I don't have people destroying me. No, you probably don't have anyone. Do you have good company, godly counsel, healthy perspective, wise leadership? Let me say it this way. The healthiest you is not a disconnected, isolated you. So sometimes it's not the overhaul of your circle. It's the development of any circle. Because circles don't just happen, they are created. They are intentionally developed and maintained. You need to start intentionally creating the right circles with the right voices. Some, some of us make bad decisions because we have the wrong voices in our circle. And some of us make bad decisions because we don't even have a circle. We're not asking anyone. Proverbs 15, plans fail for a lack of a circle. But if you want them to succeed, you might want to start intentionally creating a circle. Because here's, you know what I've had to learn? A good idea becomes a good decision when my circle confirms it. I mean, I have lots of ideas. I mean, tons of ideas. I will have more vision than we'll ever resource. I got lots of ideas. But I've found that a good idea becomes a good decision when my circle confirms it. And the problem is we don't have a circle confirming any of the major decisions you're making in your life. Look at this quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis quote day. Look at this. The next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in a circle of those who are. Yeah. I found that it's uh, to my detriment to be the sharpest person in my circle. <laughs> One of my greatest gifts is to surround myself with sharper people. And it's nearly not that hard to do. I, listen, I sit in circles all the time where I am not even close to the sharpest one in the circle. So you want a great marriage? Get in a circle with people that have great marriages. You want to be a great parent? Get in a circle with some great parents. You want to be a great student? Get in a circle with some great students. Do you want to excel in your profession? Get in a circle with people that are excelling in their profession and don't be the smartest, wisest, sharpest person in the circle. And then can I, can I just say this again? Be slow to speak and quick to listen. 
I'm, I'm trying to help you, everybody, have some healthy relationships in your life. Okay, so now you're saying, I thought you said there were five aspects. There are, but I know how you are. And once you get your fifth one, you're like, let's go and wrap it up. So I've waited. Because <laughs> you, <moved> <laughs> you moved from the crowd to the congregation to the committed to the core so that you can eventually end up at the commissioned Matthew 28, verse please. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, not just the ones that look like you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say in verse 20, teach these new disciples to obey the commands that you now understand and are living out because you're part of the commissioned and be sure of this, and look what, he, look what he comes back to, the relationship. And you'll be able to do it because of the relationship you have with me. So as a part of the commissioned, this is the move. Can you go back to the chart one more time just on the commissioned side of things? As a, listen, as a part of the commissioned now, you now live with purpose. The movement. So you've moved from the great commandment to the great commission. We started with the relationship that now ends with you now living with purpose because now it's not just about you going through this process. It's not just about you moving from the crowd to the core. It's not just about you realizing your gift and your potential, but now it's you living with purpose and understanding your responsibility to help others walk through the same process, everybody. And unless you're doing that, you're not really commissioned. Yep. Unless someone is moving through this process because of your influence in, your, in their life, you're not living the commissioned life. Which is when we realize the final need and the final need is this, people need me to invest in them. This is the commissioned life. You wake up every day and you're going, God, who are you gonna let me impact today? Whose life is going to be radically changed because of me today? Oh man, I'm just trying to make it through going down next elevator. I mean, they don't want to get on that elevator. Can I, I mean, if you want to be making this movement happen in people's lives, make sure your elevator's going up. Commission life is one of creating disciples. Go back to the chart for me, if you will, just real fast, that last chart. Look at this. This is the movement that we want for all of you. But this process and this progression doesn't happen unless you intentionally make some decisions in your relationships. You've got to change the cycle. How do I change the cycle? I change the circle that I'm engaging with. And that's what I want for you. Just leave this up here. Because you know what's outside of all of this? Our community. is out here. All the people in our community, they don't even know we're here this morning. I mean, they're completely unchurched. In Nashville, completely unchurched. They, they, listen, they might have some interest, they know about us, but they're not here. Someone that's not in church is unchurched. Quit making it more than it actually is. And they need someone like you that understands this process, this progression. See, because we all want to end up here. But we're fighting this. We're, I just, I don't have a night to give to groups. I just don't. I could look at your calendar with you for about five minutes. Because it's not about time. It's about priority. Oh, I need some good relationships in my life. They require time. We're investing our time and our efforts and our energy and our money and our resources into all kinds of, somehow you get them there to practice every time on time, sometime. Well, the coach would be way upset. I know, Whew. That's, your, that's what you value. Hey, you've got time and I'm, I'm all about sports. Love it, grew up playing them. But if it's keeping you from experience the commission life, you may need to change the circle. Because the cycle will keep repeating until you change the circle. I, I mean, I sit with people and we, we go with a, 
a game plan and what, okay, I'm going to do it. And I'm sitting with him six months later and the story is the same. I mean, I could have just recorded the last conversation. Go, whoa, 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 play. Let's just sit and listen. Is that where you're still, you're still, and most times it's because they didn't want to move to another circle. They wanted to maintain the same and get this. It doesn't happen. I mean, your relationships determine whether or not you move through this process. And you got to be willing to change the circle, to change the cycle. Let me just end really quickly with the most important relationship that you really need to be most concerned about. Because if you want healthy relationships, you have to get one relationship right first. Husband, wife, you want your relationship better? Uh, There's one relationship you better be getting better first. Because if you get that one right, that one better, I promise you, the other one will get better too. Young person, you want better relationships? You want to stop attracting the wrong guy? Make this relationship the priority with God the Father first, and I promise you, you'll start attracting a different circle. But you will keep cycling through the same type of guy with the same type of issue, which lasts about six months until you change the circle. I've had 14 boyfriends and I'm only 16. Don't say that out loud ever again. (laughs) That's not something to be proud about. Like, don't do it. Change the circle of your life and you'll change the cycle of your life. And the first step to changing the circle is introducing the voice of your master, Jesus Christ. And let me just give you this verse. I know we're running late. Psalm 9. Is anybody learning anything this morning? I just love this. I mean, this is awesome, right? Okay. Those who know him, they know him. I mean, not here, here. They they know him. Those that know him, trust in him. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So let me say this. I think part of the reasons why we don't trust God is because we don't know him. I just have a hard time trusting. I know, but the the closer you get to him and the longer he proves himself faithful and more often times than not, he always does. When you experience that over and over and over and over again, how do I have so much trust in my relationship with Ashley? I'm as close to her as I possibly can be. Not right now, but we are, we're close. (laughs) And because of her proving herself faithful to me time and time and time and time again. I can trust in the relationship. How do I trust in my relationship with God? I get as close to him and I let him prove himself over and over and over again to me in my life. Trust is born out of a real relationship. Okay, bow your heads. That's enough. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Jesus. All right there where you're at, just bow your head. and Let's invite the Holy Spirit. Hey, invite the Holy Spirit into your circle. Come on, right there. It's a small circle. It's just you and him. But invite him into your circle. Come on, start creating a new circle right now. Maybe, maybe you heard yourself in the excuses, the reasons why you haven't pursued relationship. That's too busy, Devin. I mean, I just got too much going on. I'm, I'm afraid I'll be exposed for who I really am. Fearful of dealing with conflict and my past experiences of hurt. And yet at the same time, you're so tired of repeating the cycle. And I just pray that you would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you to a different circle. It's not going to just happen. Circles are intentionally created. They're pursued. They're maintained. They're developed. And some of you today, the cycle that you've been in can be disrupted first by inviting one voice into your life. And it's the voice of the one that made you a masterpiece with so much potential. And you hear this morning and say, that's that's not been the dominant voice in my life. And I've been so frustrated by the cycle that I keep repeating, the thought patterns that are in my life, the sin habits that are in my life. And I've not invited him 
to change the circle. And if you want to change your circle today and invite God, the Father, the voice of the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth, would you just raise your hand and say, I'm going to change the cycle. I'm changing the cycle today. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. Yes, change the cycle. Change the cycle. Change the cycle. The cycle is changing for you. You're inviting the Heavenly Father into your circle. And as honestly as you can before Him, right where you're sitting, just say, God, I'm creating a new circle. And I want you to be the first one in it. And I want your voice to be the loudest in it because you're the sharpest one in my circle. And I want you to lead me, guide me, Holy Spirit. Forgive me. Forgive me for settling for a less than life. Forgive me for settling to be in the crowd and to just kind of float and not commit and not be engaged. Forgive me, God, that I, I want to build your work, build your church. Bring me the right people so I can recreate a circle that's honoring to you, that speaks to my potential and that's honest with me and protects me and knows me that's there for me on that day. Bring those people into my life. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy, for your redemption. We commit today, we commit as a church body, we commit to changing the cycle. We commit to changing the repetitive patterns in our lives by engaging with the right people, engaging with the right voices so that you can receive all honor and glory so that we can live the commissioned life, living with purpose, speaking to the potential now that's in other people and we'll wake up every day committed to that. And it's in Jesus' name we ask all of these things. And if you're thankful for the relationships that we have through Jesus Christ and you wanna change your circle today, come on, let's give God all praise and glory today. Amen.